about climate change, and we have a fantastic panel. Um, but I will just introduce today's chair, who is Professor Jim Ski. Um, and he uh, was, until 2012, the research director of the UK Energy Research Centre. Um, he then moved on to become the uh, UK Energy Strategy Fellow for Research Councils UK. And he is currently the co-chair of Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which seems to be taking him around the world quite a lot, and, and to Japan quite a lot, I'm happy to say. And so I'll leave it to you, uh, Jim, to introduce everybody else. Yeah, there you are. Oh, OK, OK, thanks very much. And this is actually the second time I think I've moderated a session here at the Daiwa Foundation. So so very, uh, very pleased to be back again to talk about uh, climate change with, with, with my colleagues. Just to say, it's about two weeks since we approved uh, the uh, IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees. It was an extremely painful process, and I, I still bear the, 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 the scars from that. And I do note that the presentations we're about to hear don't quite take account yet of perhaps of the enhanced ambition that the, uh, the Paris Agreement implies and the actions that some governments are really starting to think about uh, in terms of, of increasing ambition on climate policy. But what we're going to do is we'll have two talks of roughly 25 minutes from, from our, our two colleagues here, one focusing on the UK and one focusing on Japan. And we're going to actually reverse the order in the, uh, the original agenda. The, the UK is going to be covered first, and it's going to be covered by uh, Sam Fankhauser, who's not in fact from the UK, he's Swiss originally, but he is thoroughly acclimatised and, and, and in, in, into UK culture. He's currently director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change at the London School of Economics, and he's also deputy director of an ESRC centre there, and he has some uh, consultancy interests as well. He previously worked at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the key thing is that Sam and I were colleagues on the Committee on Climate Change in the UK. Uh, Sam left about 18, 18 months ago, something like that, and yeah. I will soon be joining Sam outside the committee as an ex-committee member. But Sam, could we pass over to you first of all, roughly 25 minutes on UK and other issues. Lovely. Good evening. I can I can uh, talk freely, but you get caught if you look at the, 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 the Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I, I will firmly stick to the the UK side of the story, which is the the part of the the two countries <coughs> I understand better. Uh, very well, I said better. But let me start with uh, a little bit of the sort of the broader climate change context, which is actually evolving quite fast. I don't know how many of you are sort of dyed in the wool climate change experts. I sort of can pick out two or three of you who are, but most of you I don't know, just with how much baggage and prior knowledge you, you come here. So let me uh, let me give you a sort of a, a few global trends, as it were, of where we are on climate change before diving in into the, into the UK uh, story. But then I also want to sort of change the narrative a little bit with the last three observations. And rather than talking about climate change policy, talk about uh, clean growth and the story of, of low carbon opportunities. So let me start with the global trends. Uh, Jim said we are not prepared for his report. That's partly true, but here's a slide of uh, this gentleman here, in case you're wondering. Sorry, I can point it. I can, uh, here, that's Jim speak. Um, so this is, the, in a sense, the story of, of, of how climate change, the debate on climate change, has evolved uh, over the last, uh, whatever it is, 25, 30 years. I've been doing these things since 1990 when I had to explain to people that climate change was not changing the investment climate because it was actually an environmental issue. And at that time, we sort of felt that uh, the sort of level of ambition, that the point at which things might start to become dangerous, were, you know, a lot of the analysis was about doubling concentration, so uh, from the pre-industrial level to twice that level, 
that was sort of considered to be roughly where we would end up. Um, the word that was used in the, the first convention on climate change, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, had those words here, prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. That was the objective. It wasn't sort of specified more than that. Um, but soon after that, a number was attached to, uh, to what we meant by dangerous. And that number was, uh, was two degrees. Two degrees means um, warming compared global average temperature increase compared to pre-industrial time, so to compared to the late 19th century. And two degrees doesn't sound like a hell of a lot, uh, but two degrees is actually something that, uh, that fundamentally changes the planet. Um, currently, or let's sort of say the, the dangerous anthropogenic interference would have probably given us three degrees. We're currently on track for three degrees. That's something that we haven't experienced for several million years. Uh, human beings, Homo sapiens as a species, has never experienced anything like that. So we're getting outside the realm of the, of the experience, of the observable. So two degrees doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is. And two degrees became the iconic number for the last 10 years or so uh, that people started working towards. Uh, and then the Paris Agreement happened, uh, the agreement that was uh, signed three years ago in, uh, in Paris at the end of 2015. And in a sense, as a, as a surprise uh, of the negotiations, the two degrees became well below two degrees. and. Uh, as an acknowledgement to, to those countries that suffer most from climate change, small island states and so on. Uh, the language also said there will be efforts towards one and a half degrees. So we've gone a long way from uh, dangerous human interference to one and a half degrees. And that was then, that one and a half degrees, three years ago that was sort of kind of the acknowledgement to small island states, we're not quite sure whether we can do it, we're not quite sure what the difference is between one and a half and two. And it just took Jim's report this year, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, where the IPCC actually came out and said one and a half degrees is really what we should aim for. Um, it makes a material difference to the risks that we face as a, as a society. Ecosystems and people have materially lower risks under one and a half degrees compared to two degrees. And it also said slightly more cautiously that one and a half degrees is is still feasible technologically, um, perhaps economically, certainly technologically. So the goalposts have moved, that's sort of important. We now increasingly will talk about one and a half degrees and the sort of society, the machinery that does climate change policy is only just now uh, becoming used to that number. But let me sort of say something about that, uh, that machinery. Um, there's actually a lot of climate change action happening on paper, if you will, in, on the statute books of countries. What you're looking at here is a statistic that we, that we compile in, in my institute, the Grants and Research Institute at the London School of Economics, about the number of climate change laws that there are on the planet. And there's over 1,500 of them. If you define them very broadly, things on energy efficiency, things on renewable energy, uh, carbon pricing, sustainable transport, forestry, flooding. Um, if you add all that, actually flooding isn't in there, but climate resilience is. If you add all those up, you get over 115 of those laws and policies. The numbers here show you um, the darker the color, the more climate change laws you find in the country. The UK here is very dark, so we're 20. Uh, Japan, uh, which I can't find here, is not quite uh, as dark. There are fewer climate change laws as well. but. Every country on the planet has climate change laws. On the left here you see some examples. Um, I put the UK Climate Change Act there, which is our framework law, the framework on which we do policy in this country. A couple of other examples there. Um, let me point out just two. Korea is interesting because it doesn't have a climate change law. Uh, it has a framework law on clean growth on low carbon green growth. So in Korea, that idea that climate policy isn't just about the environment, it's about economic prosperity has already been incorporated in law. And the other one I want to point out to you is the Climate Change Act uh, in Sweden. That's an interesting law because it sets into statute 
a target of net zero. That is a target to reduce <coughs> emissions to zero where emissions to the atmosphere are balanced out by removal of carbon <coughs> from the atmosphere. So that's very, very ambitious, or so we thought in 2017 when it was passed. Uh, net zero should be achieved in Sweden by 2045. And as it turns out in, in Jim's report on one and a half degrees from the IPCC, that's the kind of time frame that we will all need if we are serious about one and a half degrees. So Sweden, in a sense, is leading the way on that. But let's talk a little bit about the UK. Um, we're talking about the UK because, in a sense, that's where we are, and that's what the, what the mandate of the foundation is. But there are bigger reasons why the UK is a good place to look at on, on climate policy. I'll give you three. One is the Climate Change Act, that framework law that I've already mentioned which uh, sets a good basis which other countries can learn from and including Sweden actually have learned from as to how one does climate policy and there's some elements of good practice in there but also UK emissions have come down this is a chart of normalized to the year 1990 of what has happened to GDP since 1990 it has gone up by about 70 something percent a little bit dip here the economic recession 10 years ago um, greenhouse gas emissions at the same time have come down um, by about 40 something percent. If you translate that into carbon intensity, so the amount of carbon that is needed to produce a unit of GDP, a unit of economic output, you see that this number has sort of fallen by a factor three since 1990. So in the UK, we use three times less carbon to produce a unit of GDP than we did uh, in, in the year 1990. So something must have happened in the UK that uh, must have done something right. And let's sort of look a little bit what that something is. The first something is the legal basis, the framework law that we have that puts sort of people's or politicians' uh, mind uh, focused on climate change within reason. It's not sort of as perfect as I make it sound, but there are sort of elements of of, uh, of, of consensus in the UK compared to other Anglo-Saxon countries, namely another Anglo-Saxon country where that isn't the case, Australia, US, you, you, you find, you know what I mean. Um, and the Climate Change Act has sort of few things that sort of keep that focus. One is a clear target that's set in law, 80% by 2050 in the case of the UK, so not quite Swedish standards, but, but quite progressive. 80% uh, by 2050 is a long way off if you're a CEO or a politician, you don't think in those sorts of time frames. So there are short-term targets that complement the long-term uh, direction of travel. Those short-term targets are also set in law, so there's clear law that says over the next five years we're not allowed to emit more than a certain number of tons of CO2. Um, we don't just talk about emissions, and that's very important, although that's the only thing I will say about adaptation. Um, emissions is something we have to bring down, but even if we reduce uh, global warming to one and a half degrees, maybe two degrees, um, there's certain impacts that we will have to get used to. Um, maybe some of you remember the summer in the Northern Hemisphere that we just had. It was quite, uh, it was quite warm. A lot of temperature records were being broken. The one that stood out for me was the hottest ever temperature recorded reliably in the whole of Africa was reported this summer in 40 something degrees in, in Algeria. So that's a, a sort of a, a noticeable record and you have to start adapting to those sorts of changes that you can no longer, um, you know, can no longer avoid. So adaptation has to be part of your response in the UK it is. Jim mentioned the Committee on Climate Change is sort of a a very ingenious way, being biased about it, of keeping politicians' um, feet to the fire, give certain technical, complicated, controversial objectives, assign them to technocrats rather than politicians, and that's what the UK has done. Think of it as a sort of a parallel to monetary policy committee where interest rates are set by central banks and not politicians. So it's a, an equivalent sort of structure. Finally, you have to be quite clear as to who's responsible for what. So the UK has done all that, and um, one of the things that it has 
this has achieved is this picture here. We have reduced uh, carbon emissions in the power sector in particular. So the main environmental outcome over the last 10 years is the degree to which we have taken carbon out of electricity generation. This chart here, uh, you only have to focus on the black bit here. This chart here shows you the percentage of generation from different sources. And these are different years, and different colors are different sources. This is nuclear, uh, this is gas. The one to focus on is the black one, which is coal. And you see since 2012, the amount of coal in the power system has all but disappeared. We've had a few days without coal uh, generation at all over the last couple of years. Oh, sorry, last year it was for a couple of days. Um, so the UK was the first into coal, maybe the UK is the first out of the coal. So that's something that we are in the process of achieving. Um, but the most sort of successes I want to focus on are not so much the environmental one as the, the policy and procedural one, just the way the debate is being conducted, uh, which again is very different from countries like, like Australia or the US. Um, we have a relatively, uh, we have a debate about before about climate skeptics in the UK. Yes, they do exist. Yes, they're noisy. Yes, they're irritating. Yes, they write in the Daily Mail. Um, but it is also true that the, that the debate on the whole in, in, in the House of Commons is actually reasonably evidence-based. Uh, it's, it's quite a, a, sort of a, a sophisticated debate, if you will. Um, outside that little band of skeptics, there's a surprising amount of consensus in the UK about the overall targets, the 80% of the carbon budgets and the direction of travel. Uh, and that's again quite remarkable for an Anglo-Saxon country. Um, there's not a lot of consensus about how one gets to those targets. People argue about whether fracking is uh, allowed within those carbon budgets, whether we should have onshore wind, what the role of nuclear is, all those things are being debated. But the overall direction of travel is reasonably well agreed. As a result of that, the UK has a pretty good standing internationally in the climate change negotiations, and that's something that is important at the moment. Certainly there's only so many things that the UK gets a claim for internationally. Uh, climate change is, is one of them. This quote here is from somebody we interviewed about the impact of the last 10 years of climate policy. They said, uh, if you talk about the Climate Change Act, the international stage, you get a round of applause. Uh, so the UK has that authority to go out there and tell other countries uh, to bring their emissions down on the back of what we're doing at home. And then finally, as I said before, the power sector has, has really been transformed. That's sort of the main environmental outcome. Not everything is as good as it should be. And um, here, sort of, again, focusing on, on, on policies first, some of the things that happened. Uh, worked very well. If you talk to investors, say the Climate Change Act is well and good, but the policies underneath it keep changing. And I invest against policies, I don't invest against targets. So the, the investability uh, in, in the UK is not as good as it could be. Uh, certainly in renewable sectors, so investment has, has, has come down quite a bit in recent years. Um, there's some backsliding, um, illustrated by this gentleman here, who used to be our Prime Minister. Uh, David Cameron, uh, as leader of the opposition, when he detoxified the Tory parties, went out and his slogan was vote blue, as in conservative, go green. He went to Svalbard and hugged the <coughs> husky. Um, you know, green narrative, green positioning. A couple of years in, into office, when, when things got tougher, he said something else, we've got to get rid of all the green crap. Nobody knows whether he really said it, but you, sort of, you, you sense that the narrative had changed, and, and you know that is a source of worry. Um, and then let me sort of focus on that last one here. The buy-in across government departments is uneven. We have success in the power sector, but we uh, have not seen a lot of progress outside electricity generation. Look at this picture here. Power generation is this red line. The <coughs> emissions have really started coming down since about 2012. Most other sources of emission, this is transport here, emissions are flatlined. Transport is now the biggest source of emission in the UK because power sector emissions have come down, transport emissions have not. 
So we have a lot to do now moving outside the power sector into more hard to treat, more difficult sectors. Let's talk a little bit very briefly about, I only have how much, two minutes or something like that. Um, <coughs> changing gear and say this isn't about the environmental protection, this is about prosperity, this is about uh, green growth and, and green jobs and green profits. Uh, just to show you this statistic to underline that, this is from FTSE Russell, um, statistics about the size of the green economy globally, um, measured by the, the turnover, the share of revenues in listed companies that comes from, uh, from, from green activities. And uh, let me see whether, no, let me do this first, point to this. These two sectors here are oil and gas and the green economy. And you notice they're not that dissimilar. Both are about somewhere in the 5 to 6% of global market capitalization. Uh, <coughs> so revenues associated with green activities are not that dissimilar anymore. Uh, than the revenues associated with the global oil and gas sector. So these things, the balance is shifting. You're starting to talk about the green economy no longer in the abstract, but as something that exists. And if you want to, you probably can't read this, that sort of shows where green activities are in terms of sectors. A lot of it is uh, in, in the utility sectors, water, energy efficiency, and so on. But it goes across. You sort of look at this pie chart, and it has lots of colors. And that's the point. The green economy isn't just one sector that you can isolate. The green economy is everywhere. It's green finance, it's low carbon architecture, it's consulting, it's buildings. It's, it's every sector you can think of has its green element. That's sort of where we are going. Let me ask then the final chart, which takes a bit of explaining, I'll do it quick. Um, how well is Japan, how well are the UK, is the UK positioned for that green economy? Uh, if the world goes green, stops emitting carbon, um, will our industries in our respective countries do well in that new world or not? This is a little bit of playing around as to which sectors will do well, which sectors will not. Um, each one of those red bubbles is a, is a manufacturing sector. The size of the bubble shows how big the sector is. You measure on one axis um, green innovation, how good those sectors are at patenting green new technologies. We measure at the other axis, the x-axis, uh, how, how much of a comparative advantage uh, this country's already had in those sectors. So the UK is sort of good, uh, I think this is pulp and paper, something like that, where the UK has a comparative advantage. And that gives you a little bit of a SWOT analysis. If you're good at innovation, you're already good today up here. Those are your strengths. Those are the sectors where you feel we'll be okay in the green economy. You're good today, we'll be good tomorrow. You have opportunities here. You're not very good today, but you're good at green innovation. So tomorrow, on the back of that green innovation, you build up new comparative advantages. These are your opportunities. Then you have threats. You're currently good. Sectors, you're currently uh, very well positioned, but there's no green innovation going on, so presumably you lose that strength uh, in the green economy. So those are your threat. And then the final sector is your weakness. You're rubbish today. You'll be rubbish tomorrow. And look just at the picture. Don't worry about the sectors. Just look at where Japan is and where the UK is. Japan is much, much better positioned to be a leader in the green economy uh, compared to the UK. The UK does have strengths and opportunities. but a lot of stuff here where nothing green happens. <coughs> Japan, very disciplined, a lot of green innovation and activity. Those little ones here is comparing um, our two countries with Korea and with China. And you see that Asia, it's not just a Japanese story, it's an Asian story. Asia is very good at positioning itself in the green economy. And with that, I should stop and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, th thanks Anne. There will be plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. So we'll move uh, straight on to our second speaker, who's Takeshi Kuramochi, and he's been working on energy and climate policy for a long time. He was at the Institute for Global Environmental Studies in Japan, which is a body I know well. I've never visited, but I keep meeting people all around the world and feel I know the institution uh, quite well. 
and he is now working on climate policy at the New Climate Institute uh, based in Cologne in Germany, very close to Bonn, where all the climate negotiations take place, so very conveniently negotiated. And he also uh, contributes regularly to the annual UN Environment uh, publication, the Emissions Gap Report, which measures cruelly how far we have to go to get ourselves on the right track. So, Takeshi, maybe 25 minutes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, th thank you, uh, first of all, to the organizers for uh, having me here today uh, among the distinguished uh, experts. Uh, my name is Takeshi Kuramochi from New Climate Institute, and today I'm presenting the uh, Japan's uh, progress on climate policy, uh, climate change mitigation. And yeah, from Sam's presentation, Japan's apparently pretty good at a uh, race on the green innovation, but uh, my presentation is not that positive. <laughs> so I'm warning you on that. Okay, uh, I would start with um, the key figure from the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. So if you want to stay, um, yeah, keep the warming uh, below 1.5 degrees, basically you have to reduce total net CO2 emissions to zero uh, around 2050. And you can see that, um, so here's where we are right now more or less and it has to go straight down in the next 30 years. So this is an enormous challenge, as we all know. Okay, now looking at what has, uh, how's the Japan's emissions have been uh, for the last 25 years, uh, since 1990 to 2016. Yeah, it hasn't changed. <laughs> so it has, it has basically almost more or less flat. You see some, oh, sorry. You see some fluctuations. Here's a global economic crisis, and then there was a, a Fukushima nuclear accident. So there were some uh, ups and downs, but more or less it hasn't changed since 1990. And Japan uh, has uh, future targets for 2020, 2030. That's a nationally determined contribution uh, under the Paris Agreement. And then also a 2050 targets. Uh, and both 2030 and 2050 targets are enshrined uh, under this uh, Promotion Act for Global uh, Warming uh, Countermeasures and its Implementation Plan. And I gave the full word wording of Promotion Act because Promotion Act is not as strong as the Basic Act as you can see in the energy policy. So climate policy in Japan is not the main pillar as you know, on par with energy policy, for example. So now I'm going to sh uh, show you uh, how ambitious Japan's uh, climate uh, mitigation target is. So there are a lot of ways to uh, assess what's the fair share of uh, emissions or emission reductions. And at, uh, in the, under the Climate Action Tracker project, we look at many, many different uh, effort sharing or burden sharing approaches, and then we take a range on more or less what levels are um, Paris Agreement compatible or two degrees compatible or highly insufficient or critically insufficient. Uh, the United States below to this category, for example. Um, so you can see that Japan's uh, 2020 and 2030 targets are highly insufficient and also 25, uh, 2050 targets, which is an 80% reduction target, is also not in line with um, Paris Agreement long-term goals. And I can uh, explain you a bit uh, the background of these targets. So why the 2020 target is so high is that initially in 2010, Japan had a 25% 25 reduction, uh, 25 reduction target compared to 1990. Uh, under the Copenhagen Accord, that was uh, in 2010, but that was canceled uh, after the uh, Fukushima accident. And they replaced the original target with this um, yeah, uh, current target. In the previous one, uh, they assumed more or less 50% uh, nuclear power share in, 20, 20, uh, 20, in, the long, in, lo in the longer term. Uh, but yeah, that is not happening. So they assumed zero nuclear power with very uh, little uh, renewables and basically all power supplied by gas and coal. And for 2030 targets, uh, the, how they developed the targets is that they assumed that e economy would grow as 
uh, they, they have targeted uh, under this uh, government economic stimulus st strategy. So the annual uh, GDP increase is about 2% per year, up all the way up to 2030. And that increases the baseline energy consumption that is assumed under this target. So that's why the target is actually not, doesn't look so ambitious. And at, in reality, the economy is only growing at less than 1% uh, increase per year for the last several years. So just by looking at energy consumption, probably Japan is likely to uh, meet its uh, target uh, in 2030. Uh, the current uh, climate action tracker analysis shows that it's still not, just not enough uh, under uh, existing policies, but if, um, yeah, there are a few more uh, yeah, policies uh, that, that will be implemented in the sectors that Japan uh, still has a weak policies, then Japan is very likely to achieve the 2030 target. Having said that, still the curve towards 2050, 80% uh, reduction of decarbonization, um, the reduction speed has to accelerate. That's for sure. Okay, now I move on to a uh, more uh, sector specific uh, yeah, uh, issues. So, first I will start with the power sector. So power sector uh, is uh, one of the biggest uh, emitting sector, accounting for more than 40% of energy-related CO2. Uh, after 2011, uh, the, with the Fukushima disaster, um, the energy uh, electricity <coughs> demand has uh, decreased quite significantly. So I think it was somewhere between 5 to 10% uh, decrease at one point. Uh, by 20, uh, 2015, but now it's again uh, on, back on the uh, slightly increasing trend. So, for Japan, it's a uh, yeah, big, big question whether you know, the Japanese economy can, can keep those, uh, those stringent energy saving efforts uh, towards 2030. And when you look at the uh, electricity mix, uh, before a uh, Fukushima accident, um, nuclear had 26% share, and now it's more or less zero, um, less than 5%. Um, here, I show the 2030 target, uh, which was uh, also uh, communicated to the UNFCCC uh, with the uh, National Determined Contribution Target. They want to uh, bring the nuclear share back to 20 to 22%. However, when you look at the current situation on the, um, the reactor restart applications, there are 25 that has been uh, applied up to now, even when all these 25 would go back uh, back online, and and plus the two uh, reactors in con uh, uh, construction would get onto the grid, you would still only have a, about 16 to 17 percent share in 2030. So this target is very like uh, unlikely to be achieved uh, unless uh, more new, new uh, reactors will um, yeah be constructed. And also, there are a lot of court cases uh, happening uh, in the uh, recent years, so there will be a lot of you know, stops and goes uh, for many reactors. So we're, we're not even sure if we, this uh, number can be achieved. And yeah, since the nuclear power uh, generation has reduced, uh, most of the gap has been uh, filled by gas and coal. So now we have... Uh, yeah, 34% coal and 37% gas. And for coal power, there's a, a, now we have about 45 gigawatts of uh, coal power capacity. And uh, in addition to that, there's a, a, a up to 18 gigawatt of uh, construction plants uh, in the pipeline. Of course, not all of them will be, uh, be realized, but uh, this is uh, one of the major concerns, uh, whether Japan is really serious or really committed to uh, long-term decarbonization. Because once you build coal power plants, it will go on, um, go on operation for more than 40 years. Uh, at this moment, uh, the Minister of uh, Environment has this uh, environmental impact assessment procedure. And in, in that procedure, uh, the CO2 emission intensity of new power plants is, uh, will, will be scrutinized. And this process has been uh, functioning uh, partially as a gatekeeper for uh, all these um, coal construction plants. Now, uh, now on the renewables, um, 
what is uh, significant is that uh, in the new basic energy plan, with, this is a, a sort of national energy strategy go all, way, all the way up to you know, uh, 2030 and beyond. Now the renewable energy is uh, referred to as main power source. Uh, this is a huge, quite a, a significant change in the uh, METI, the Economic uh, Ministry's policy, because renewable energy was never considered as main power source before, even though they said important, but yeah. Always, it was below uh, other technologies such as nuclear. So this is a significant shift in their uh, energy policy. Uh, you also see that um, this, that renewable energy has been um, share has been increasing uh, steadily from around 10 percent, which was mostly uh, hydropower in 2010, to now uh, 16 percent. And this is uh, largely thanks to the feed-in tariff scheme uh, introduced in 2012. It's mostly uh, solar PV, and the tariff rates are quite generous, and now the extra cost on the household is quite high that they introduced um, auction scheme for large solar projects, but this uh, auctions hasn't been uh, really successful, so th it's uh, in a kind of trial and error phase. And also, this is very recent news that um, the uh, Kyushu Electric Power, the Kyushu is the, one, one of the uh, Southwest uh, Islands, they had to uh, restrict the solar power uh, con accessing the grid um, due to its high, uh, high power output. So in the Kyushu Electric Power, there are uh, some o orders on which uh, electricity to uh, you know, uh, stop operate, uh, which um, power plants stop operating in case you have a huge amount of uh, renewables. But uh, the key issue was that they could not export uh, much of uh, the solar electricity outside Kyushu Island because the interconnection of the uh, of the grid in uh, Kyushu and the other regions, the capacity is so uh, quite small that they couldn't really uh, export all that they produced. So for Japan, um, the interconnection of the these uh, regional grids this is this is going to be a key issue if you uh, if the country wants to uh, boost renewable energy deployment. Okay, now I move on to uh, the energy end use sectors. So here you see the emission trends of uh, industries, transport, and uh, buildings. So for industries, the trend has been, yeah, on the yeah de decreasing since 1990, and also for the transport since around 2000, it's on a decreasing trend. And actually, this trend is quite interesting compared to other developed economies because most other de developed economies have. Uh, flat emission levels uh, in the last 15 years. So in that sense, Japan is doing a pretty good job. The problem is the building sector. It has been uh, uh, continuously <coughs> increasing, and I'll touch on that later. Okay, first, uh, good news on the re uh, recent policy developments in the energy and use sectors. So on the economy-wide measures, there was a revision of the Energy Conservation Act um, in Japan. So you know, uh, improving energy efficiency at uh, sort of uh, office level or um, op um, yeah, office level or unit level, there's a limit to it. So now the uh, Minister of Economy is promoting sort of systemic uh, energy efficiency improvements. So the, uh, um, the companies can tag team with other companies or operators so that they can sort of systematically reduce their uh, energy use. So this is a, one of the in, uh, interesting uh, developments. And also on the transport sector, uh, recently there was an uh, interim report published on the long-term strategy for car manufacturing. Uh, in this uh, the strategy formulation committee, there were CEOs of all uh, major car uh, companies uh, attending. And there they uh, committed, well, it's still a draft phase, but they uh, committed to uh, reduce tanked wheel C2 emissions by 80% by uh, 2050, and 90% for new passenger vehicles, which means that almost all cars will be either electric or hydrogen. So this is uh, quite an interesting development, because, uh, for example, Toyota has been pretty uh, reserved about uh, electric vehicles, and uh, they, they have good, um, they have a with hybrid technology and also they have been developing fuel cell technology, but they were not so much into the EV uh, electric vehicle technology. And that there you were also seeing changes. So this is a positive development. Uh, 
Now, uh, the challenges uh, for buildings. So buildings, as I sh uh, shown before, there's no clear sign of emissions peaking. And for building sector, there, there are uh, uh, emission reduction targets. Uh, basically, they want to uh, reach average net zero energy for uh, new builds by 2030. And also for uh, houses, um, household, uh, well, new houses, they want to achieve uh, basically 50% uh, share of net zero uh, energy buildings by 2020. But actually, it's pretty, yeah, kind of lagging behind. Uh, 2017 results was only 23%. So it's not, uh, it's not so certain that this, these targets will be achieved. And also, the government policy is relatively weak on, the, uh, on reducing energy use in existing buildings or existing houses. So there are some subsidies and um, support schemes, but um, this is one of the areas that you know, the government may uh, be able to uh, strengthen their policies. OK, uh, next one, uh, industry. So I, I've shown that the industry emissions have been on a decreasing trend since 1990. But uh, when you consider um, the full decarbonization of the sector, there are uh, quite a few challenges. And particularly steel sector and cement sector, these are the sectors that um, where zero emissions is extremely difficult. Um, from, you know, from the cement sector, for example, when you Produce, uh, produce clinker from the raw materials you have <coughs> CO2 emissions. And that is very, um, you cannot reduce it unless you bury them underground through uh, carbon capture and storage technologies. Or you substitute uh, cement with other materials. But there's a limit to it. And government doesn't have, uh, sorry, um, so this is uh, for the steel sector. They have, uh, they, they have been developing uh, this uh, advanced blast furnace technology equipped with CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage technology, but still in the uh, sort of, um, yeah, development phase, it's not fully commercialized. <coughs> and also the government does not have a clear vision and strategy for uh, sector transition decarbonization in the longer term. So there's no clear roadmap to how they would uh, decarbonize the sector. So this is uh, one of the key ch uh, big challenges uh, still um, that Japan needs to address. Uh, speaking of long-term decarbonization, uh, Japan needs to publish uh, its long-term uh, decarbonization strategy to the UNF uh, UNFCCC by next June when uh, Japan hosts the G20 summit. Uh, as a sort of uh, preparatory uh, process, uh, two ministries, then, uh, Economic Ministry and the uh, Environment Ministry both prepared uh, the published reports, but they focus on completely different things. Uh, economic uh, economic uh, Ministry, they're often very reserved about domestic uh, emission reduction, so they instead focus on global uh, overall mitigation of emissions, and also they want to promote uh, the exports of Japanese low carbon technologies. And so, therefore, they focus on more on the strategies for innovation and finance, and also, uh, yeah, from this uh, sort of re yeah, reservation on domestic reductions, they are very critical on near-term carbon pricing. The Ministry of the Environment uh, does exactly the opposite. They focus on domestic uh, mitigation, basically discussing how to reduce, the, uh, how to achieve the 80% reduction <coughs> target by 2050 and also shows how the 2050 low carbon society may look like. So they go through uh, sector by sector, uh, what kind of options available, and also what kind of uh, society it might look like. And also calls for full-fledged carbon pricing uh, in the very short term. So I, uh, the, the, uh, the cabinet committee on the, the decarbonization strategy uh, has been uh, set up in, uh, in August, I think, and now they have to reconcile the differences between the two. And I cannot clearly see how that's going to happen. But yeah, we'll see. OK, um, until now, I focused on the government policies. Do, do, do I still have time? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. no, 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 yeah. Now I uh, look, look a bit into the action in the business sector. So um, this is a figure on how many uh, companies are reporting their 
um, emission reduction commitments as well as their emission inventories to CDP. That's a carbon disclosure project. <coughs> Um, it it's an organization that collects all kinds of business uh, uh, act, uh, emission reduction activity data. And here you can see that um, the total revenue of those companies reporting to CDP uh, amounts up to three and a half trillion dollars. And that is quite, com yeah, uh, that's not bad compared to US or the EU. So at the business uh, sector level, it, they're doing a pretty good job. However, um, when you look at the emissions covered by these companies, uh, Japan's pretty far behind um, the U.S. and EU, which means that for Japan, um, the IT sector, the, uh, more the service sector companies and also like a, yeah, financial services, those are uh, more sort of proactive in these em uh, emission reduction efforts. Uh, the next one, uh, this is on divestment from coal. So, yeah, the financial, uh, the investment firms, banks, they ha have a crucial role in you know, uh, the, the decarbonization of the society or the world. And Japan, Japanese banks have been quite conservative about uh, the divestment from coal, but since uh, early 2018, it has been happening, uh, yeah, has, there are a lot of uh, announcements coming in. And yeah, here is this example of insurance companies, and then you have trading houses, it's a Marubeni, which is the most recent one. So the actual, uh, yeah, the content of these uh, divestment announcements differ from company to company. Some still allows for investments in uh, the very high uh, efficiency <coughs> coal power plants, whereas others would just, uh, yeah, pull out from any coal power plant. So there are differences, but this uh, divestment uh, is slowly but steadily picking up speed, which is which we didn't uh, imagine uh, seeing this uh, in Japan uh, a few years back. So uh, just uh, to wrap up uh, my presentation, so Japan has made limited progress on emission reduction since 1990, but the picture might be changing in the next decades. And to thir uh, 2030 targets will almost be uh, achieved without additional policies, which means that there is room for uh, raising uh, ambition towards uh, further uh, stronger targets. And yeah, the energy uh, uh, energy use reduction uh, after Fukushima accident is one of the uh, important factors to, uh, to look at, and also the renewables. So uh, I mentioned that most of the uh, renewable energy deployment until now is solar, but it has to be balanced. You, you have to have more wind power and also the system flexibility will be uh, key to uh, mass, uh, mass deployment. And lastly, um, this 80% reduction by 2050 or uh, long-term tra uh, transition to 1.5 degree consistent pathway requires fundamental transformation from all sectors. You can see that uh, for transport sector, its the outlook is comparatively optimistic, whereas uh, for buildings and industry, it will be uh, very, very challenging. And lastly, the business action is key, as we all know. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, th thank you, and thanks to both speakers uh, for, for keeping to time. Uh, now, they work you hard when you chair DIWA, DIWA meetings, so as, w as well as uh, sort of chairing the discussion, I'm also asked to make a few comments on, on the two presentations that we, we've heard. And I'm allowed 20 minutes, which I'm absolutely not going to use. But let me, let, let me just uh, say, say a few things. The one thing I would observe about the UK and Japan, something we share as nations, as a kind of an innate sense of their superiority, <laughs> if I can put it that way. But it, there is a veneer at the same time of modesty and self-deprecation uh, that, that goes with it. And I think that self-deprecation has actually been seen in both cases, because in Sam's case there was a little this reference to the UK's industrial and innovation policy, which he ended up on. And in the case of Takeshi, you, you gave Japan quite a hard time in terms of <laughs> climate policy initially. So if I can sort of comment on, on these two things. I mean, first of all, on Japan. I think Japan's climate policy faces huge, huge challenges. Japan does not 
of its own indigenous fossil fuel resources. So it is for energy security reasons as well as, um, uh, as, as climate reasons. Uh, producing its own indigenous energy means nuclear or renewables and putting a break on demand. That's really wh where, it, where it lies. And frankly, I was there about a year ago for, for a big commission that was, was taking place on energy and climate policy. And what did strike me there, to echo what, what, what you said, was this realisation that the nuclear thing was not going to be easy to solve. It was going to be difficult to get new plants going, and it was even going to be difficult to get the old plants back online again because of uh, public acceptability. And for the first time, I saw that sign that renewables was kind of going to be mainstreamed and you know, things were different. But I do think there is a little bit of cultural resistance there. This was on a different trip. I had to go and give a talk in Hokkaido about climate and energy. So I did a bit of homework on the Hokkaido energy system and discovered uh, the, the land area is about the same as Ireland, uh, the population is about the same as Ireland, the electricity system is the same size, and they both have weak links you know, to, 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 to their neighbouring islands uh, there. And the striking thing was that Ireland has about 20 to 25% of its energy from wind, electricity from wind, and a Hokkaido, when I looked, was something like 3 to 5%. And it was declared to me that it was absolutely physically impossible for Hokkaido to do any better than that. And there is a kind of, a little bit of a pushback, and that, that getting renewables over that hurdle of acceptability, I, I think, is, is really quite important. And the, the second thing to observe, I, I think, is also about what uh, Takeshi met, also mentioned, is the, 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 the different ministries and the approaches that they take. Now, in IPCC, we have to choose authors with respect for country balance and regional balance. And when we come to Japan, we think about the balance between METI-sponsored authors and MOEJ-sponsored <laughs> authors as well because we know that they are actually coming from rather, ra rather different perspectives. So this thing of getting a unified policy, uh, you know, I think is really quite a, quite a challenge in, in Japan. Now, just to say, one other, uh, actually, and it's kind of a question, um, you know, for Takeshi as well, is on the transportation side, because most of the world has decided the electric vehicles are the way forward, and Japan is still hanging on to the idea that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles might be the route. And as I uh, figured it out, the kind of the model is that uh, you would produce the hydrogen by reforming natural gas in Indonesia, or, or wherever it's produced, turn it into hydrogen there, and ship the hydrogen to Japan, and then burn it with no carbon footprint in, in, in vehicles. Now this obviously has a big, a big, big ad <coughs> advantage. And it also has the advantage that you can sell the steam reformation equipment to Indonesia uh, and you know, keep Japanese business doing so. So it's a very interesting, you, you kind of trying to this link between environmental policy and industrial policy, which I think you, you, you've strongly hinted at. And it's very much the case, I think, that you know, METI's view of the world is that it's about you know, creating business for Japan overseas with its policies as well. So not only building new coal plants in Japan, but selling efficient, ultra-supercritical coal plant to other countries in the Asia-Pacific region as well. And I think a holistic view of industrial plus climate policy in Japan needs to, needs to take all, all of the, you know, the, these elements together. So that innovation and industrial side is, is very strong. Now, turning to the UK side, I mean, I completely, uh, you, since we were on the same committee on climate change, I couldn't disagree with the word that, that Sam, Sam has said. And I think it's right that the architecture of the Climate Change Act, which is now 10 years old this year, is actually fairly ingenious in solving the time inconsistency problem of setting a long-term target but insisting that there are mid-term targets that have to be consistent. And we have been very successful in complying with all our carbon budgets. But all of that success has come from one place. It's come on the electricity side of it, uh, as, as Sam has said. And that was partly because we had a big electricity market reform, which has delivered on what it is intended to do. And it's partly because of that that we, we, we've backed out of coal. But we have not had the same successes in <coughs> other sectors. And it has also been quite easy to hit our carbon budgets and targets 
because they were set originally uh, just before the, the great economic crash 10 years ago. And so economic activity has been lower than originally anticipated. And so emissions have been lower than anticipated. And there have also been very strange uh, Alice in Wonderland accounting around the EU emissions trading scheme, which would take a, an hour to explain, which has also helped us, helped us on the way. So one of the big challenges for the UK is we may well run out of rope in about 10 years' time unless we really step up the ambition in terms of climate policy and extend the successes in electricity over to other sectors, into transportation, into the built environment, and also into the land sector, which could be important in the UK, that will make a big difference. Now, just to flag on, on Sam's point on industrial and uh, innovation policy, Originally, the UK used to have a low carbon strategy to help deal with the Climate Change Act. It's now got a clean growth strategy, and that, that now does the job for government. So this uh, issue that of, of linking economic prosperity to uh, a climate policy is now, you know, extremely important. Now, Sam painted quite, quite a depressing picture about the UK in, in his final slide, and if I can half agree with it and half not agree with it, uh, one of the pieces of work I'm currently doing is finishing off a book comparing in, in energy innovation policies in different countries. And actually, being forced to write the whole of UK innovation policy over the last 50 years in 2,000 words really focuses down onto you where the strengths and weaknesses are. And one of the issues in the UK is that we've constantly rebooted our innovation policy. We have endless reviews uh, where we go back to first principles and revisit our institutional structures. The Rothschild Review, the Lambert Review, the Hauser Review, the Nurse Review, they've all come one after the other. They've gone back to first principles and recommended quite substantial changes. And that has definitely lead to, led to some kind of weaknesses in the system because we're constantly changing things. But one thing I do want to say about, about uh, Japan, again, when I was there about a year, 18 months ago, we were specifically interviewing people in Japan about their innovation policies. And talking to METI officials, it wasn't quite the optimistic picture that perhaps Sam, Sam presented, because a lot of Japanese innovation has been focused in the industrial, con big industrial conglomerates. And there was a lot of anxiety in METI about the fact that a lot of innovation in the future would be kind of bottom-up, consumer-focused, and this was reliant strongly on things like the big clusters in California, the linkages between industry and universities, which is not strong in Japan. The innovation strength is focused in different kind of areas. And I can't help thinking, you know, Japan kind of led in terms of mobile telephony. It was a technologically superior system in Japan. But when you go back there now, everybody's looking at their iPhones on the Tokyo Metro. And you're so imported technology is kind of overtaken. And that kind of consumer-focused innovation, I think, could, could potentially be quite a big challenge for Japan.